Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Another World Audiobooks. Like I said last time, we are coming close to the end of this first book of Tarzan. So what do you guys want to hear next? Which book should we do next? And if you're an indie author, talk to me. I want to I want to do some non-public domain books. I want to do some new fresh things. So if you're an indie author, if you know an indie author, get in touch with me. Let's make something happen. So now without further ado, I give you Tarzan. Chapter 21. The Village of Torture. As the little expedition of sailors toiled through the dense jungle searching for signs of Jane Porter, the futility of their venture became more and more apparent, but the grief of the old man and the hopeless eyes of the young Englishman prevented the kind-hearted D'Arnault from turning back. He thought that there might be a bare possibility of finding her body, or the remains of it, for he was positive that she had been devoured by some beast of prey. He deployed his men into a skirmish line from the point where Esmeralda had been found, and in this extended formation they pushed their way, sweating and panting, through the tangled vines and creepers. It was slow work. Noon found them but a few miles inland. They halted for a brief rest then, and after pushing on for a short distance further, one of the men discovered a well-marked trail. It was an old elephant track, and day or not, after consulting with Professor Porter and Clayton, decided to follow it. The path wound through the jungle in a northeasterly direction, and along it the column moved in single file. Lieutenant Dalnaut was in the lead and moving at a quick pace, for the trail was comparatively open. Immediately behind him came Professor Porter, but as he could not keep pace with the younger man, Dalnaut was a hundred yards in advance, when suddenly a half-dozen black warriors arose about him. Dale Nott gave a warning shout to his column as the blacks closed on him, but before he could draw his revolver, he had been pinioned and dragged into the jungle. His cry had alarmed the sailors, and a dozen of them sprang forward past Professor Porter, running up the trail to the officer's aid. They did not know the cause of his outcry, only that it was a warning of danger ahead. They had rushed past the spot where Dale Nott had been seized, when a spear hurled from the jungle transfixed one of the men, and then a volley of arrows fell among them. Raising their rifles, they fired into the underbrush in the direction from which the missiles had come. By this time, the balance of the party had come up, and volley after volley was fired toward the concealed foe. It was these shots that Tarzan and Jane Porter had heard. Lieutenant Carpentier, who had been bringing up the rear of the column, now came running to the scene, and, on hearing the details of the ambush, ordered the men to follow him, and plunged into the tangled vegetation. In an instant, they were in a hand-to-hand fight with some fifty black warriors of Mubonga's village. Arrows and bullets flew thick and fast. African knives and French gun butts mingled for a moment in savage and bloody duels, but soon the natives fled into the jungle, leaving the Frenchmen to count their losses. Four of the twenty were dead, a dozen others were wounded, and Lieutenant Dernon was missing. Night was falling rapidly, and their predicament was rendered doubly worse when they could not even find the elephant trail which they had been following. There was but one thing to do, make camp where they were until daylight. Lieutenant Carpentier ordered a clearing made, and a circular arbutus of underbrush constructed about the camp. This work was not completed until long after dark, the men building a huge fire in the center of the clearing to give them light to work by. When all was safe as possible against attack of wild beasts and savage men, Lieutenant Carpentier placed sentries about the little camp, and the tired and hungry men threw themselves upon the ground to sleep. The groans of the wounded, mingled with the roaring and growling of the great beasts which the noise and firelight had attracted, kept sleep except in its most fitful form from the tired eyes. It was a sad and hungry party that lay through the long night praying for dawn. The blacks who had seized Dayonault had not waited to participate in the fight which had followed, but instead had dragged their prisoner a little way through the jungle, and then struck the trail further on, beyond the scene of the fighting in which their fellows were engaged. They hurried him along, the sound of battle growing fainter and fainter as they drew away from the contestants, until there suddenly broke upon Dayonault's vision, a good-sized clearing at one end of which stood a thatched and palisaded village. It was now dusk, but the watchers at the gate saw the approaching trio, and distinguished one as a prisoner ere they reached the portals. A cry went up within the palisade. A great throng of women and children rushed out to meet the party, and then began for the French officer the most terrifying experience which man can encounter upon earth, the reception of a white prisoner into a village of African cannibals. To add to the fiendishness of their cruel savagery was the poignant memory of still crueler barbarities practiced upon them and theirs by the white officers of that arch-hypocrite, Leopold II of Belgium, because of whose atrocities they had fled the Congo Free State, a pitiful remnant of what had once been a mighty tribe. 
They fell upon Dionaut, tooth and nail, beating with sticks and stones, and tearing at him with claw-like hands. Every vestige of clothing was torn from him, and the merciless blows fell upon his bare and quivering flesh. But not once did the Frenchman cry out in pain. He breathed a silent prayer that he be quickly delivered from his torture. But the death he prayed for was not so easily had. Soon the warriors beat the women away from their prisoner. He was to be saved for a nobler sport than this, and the first wave of their passion having subsided, they contented themselves with crying out taunts and insults and spitting upon him. Presently they reached the centre of the village. There, Dionor was bound securely to the great post from which no live man has ever been released. A number of the women scattered to their several huts to fetch pots and water, while others built a row of fires on which portions of the feast were to be boiled, while the balance would be slowly dried in strips for future use, as they expected the other warriors to return with many prisoners. The festivities were delayed, awaiting the return of the warriors, who had remained to engage in the skirmish with the white men, so it was quite late when all were in the village, and the dance of death commenced to circle around the doomed officer. Half fainting from pain and exhaustion, they are not watched from beneath half-closed lids what seemed but the vagary of delirium, or some horrid nightmare from which he must soon wake. The bestial faces, daubed with colour, the huge mouths and flabby hanging lips, the yellow teeth, sharp-filed, the rolling demon eyes, the shining naked bodies, the cruel spears. Surely no such creatures really existed upon earth. He must indeed be dreaming. The savage whirling bodies circled nearer. Now a spear sprang forth and touched his arm. The sharp pain and the feeling of hot, trickling blood assured him of the awful reality of his hopeless position. Another spear, and then another touched him. He closed his eyes and held his teeth set firm. He would not cry out. He was a soldier of France, and he would teach these beasts how an officer and a gentleman died. Tarzan of the Apes needed no interpreter to translate the story of those distant shots. With Jane Porter's kisses still warm upon his lips, he was swinging with incredible rapidity through the forest trees straight toward the village of Mubonga. He was not interested in the location of the encounter, for he judged that that would soon be over. Those who were killed he could not aid. Those who escaped would not need his assistance. It was to those who had neither been killed or escaped that he hastened, and he knew that he would find them by the great post in the center of Mubongo's village. Many times had Tarzan seen Mubongo's black raiding parties return from the northward with prisoners, and always were the same scenes enacted about the grim stake beneath the flaring light of many fires. He knew, too, that they seldom lost much time before consummating the fiendish purpose of their captures. He doubted that he would arrive in time to do more than avenge. On he sped. Night had fallen, and he travelled high along the upper terrace, where the gorgeous tropical moon lighted the dizzying pathway through the gently undulating branches of the treetops. Presently, he caught the reflection of a distant blaze. It lay to the right of his path. It must be the light from the campfire the two men had built before they were attacked. Tarzan knew nothing of the presence of the sailors. So sure was Tarzan of his jungle knowledge that he did not turn from his course, but passed the glare at a distance of a half-mile. It was the camp of the Frenchman. In a few minutes more, Tarzan swung into the village trees above Mubonga's village. Ah, he was not quite too late. Or was he? He could not tell. The figure at the stake was very still, yet the black warriors were still pricking it. Tarzan knew their customs. The death blow had not been struck. He could tell almost to a minute how far the dance had gone. In another instant, Mubonga's knife would sever one of the victim's ears. That would mark the beginning of the end— for very shortly after, only a writhing mass of mutilated flesh would remain. There would still be life in it, but death then would be the only charity it craved. The stake stood forty feet from the nearest tree. Tarzan coiled his rope. Then there rose suddenly above the fiendish cries of dancing demons the awful challenge of the ape-man. The dancers halted as though turned to stone. The rope sped with singing whirr high above the heads of the blacks. It was quite invisible in the flaring lights of the campfires. Dionaut opened his eyes. A huge black, standing directly before him, lunged backward, as though felled by an invisible hand. Struggling and shrieking, his body, rolling from side to side, moved quickly toward the shadows beneath the trees. The blacks, their eyes protruding in horror, watched spellbound. Once beneath the tree, the body rose straight into the air, and as it disappeared into the foliage above, the terrified negroes, screaming with fright, broke into a mad race for the village gate. Dionaut was left alone. He was a brave man, 
but he had felt the short hairs bristle upon the nape of his neck when that uncanny cry arose upon the air. As the writhing body of the black soared, as though by unearthly power, into the dense foliage of the forest, Dionot felt an icy shiver run along his spine, as though death had risen from a dark grave and laid a cold and clammy finger on his flesh. As Dionot watched the spot where the body had entered the tree, he heard the sounds of movement there. The branches swayed as though under the weight of a man's body. There was a crash, and the black came sprawling to earth again, to lie very quietly where he had fallen. Immediately after him came a white body, but this one alighted erect. Dionot saw a clean-limbed young giant emerge from the shadows into the firelight and come quickly toward him. What could it mean? Who could it be? Some new creature of torture and destruction, doubtless. Dionot waited. His eyes never left the face of the advancing man, nor did the other's frank, clear eyes waver beneath Dionot's fixed gaze. Dionot was reassured, but still without much hope, though he felt that the face could not mask a cruel heart. Without a word, Tarzan of the Apes cut the bonds which held the Frenchman. Weak from suffering and loss of blood, he would have fallen, but for the strong arm that caught him. He felt himself lifted from the ground. There was a sensation as of flying, and then he lost consciousness. Chapter 22 The Search Party When dawn broke upon the little camp of Frenchmen in the heart of the jungle, it found a sad and disheartened group. As soon as it was light enough to see their surroundings, Lieutenant Carpentier sent men in groups of three in several directions to locate the trail, and in ten minutes it was found, and the expedition was hurrying back toward the beach. It was slow work, for they bore the bodies of six dead men. Two more having succumbed during the night, and several of those who were wounded required support to move even very slowly. Carpentier had decided to return to camp for reinforcements, and then make an attempt to track down the natives and rescue de Arnault. It was late in the afternoon when the exhausted men reached the clearing by the beach, but for two of them the return brought so great a happiness that all their suffering and heartbreaking grief was forgotten on the instant. As the little party emerged from the jungle, the first person that Professor Porter and Cecil Clayton saw was Jane, standing by the cabin door. With a little cry of joy and relief, she ran forward to greet them, throwing her arms about her father's neck and bursting into tears for the first time since they had been cast upon this hideous and adventurous shore. Professor Porter strove manfully to suppress his own emotions, but the strain upon his nerves and weakened vitality were too much for him, and at length, Burying his old face in his girl's shoulder, he sobbed quietly like a tired child. Jane led him toward the cabin, and the Frenchman turned toward the beach, from which several of their fellows were advancing to meet them. Clayton, wishing to leave father and daughter alone, joined the sailors and remained talking with the officers until their boat pulled away toward the cruiser, where the lieutenant Carpentier was bound to report the unhappy outcome of his adventure. Then Clayton turned back slowly toward the cabin. His heart was filled with happiness— the woman he loved was safe. He wondered by what manner of miracles she had been spared. To see her alive seemed almost unbelievable. As he approached the cabin, he saw Jane coming out. When she saw him, she hurried forward to meet him. Jane! he cried. God has been good to us indeed. Tell me how you escaped. What form Providence took to save you for us. He had never before called her by a given name. Forty-eight hours before, it would have suffused Jane with a soft glow of pleasure to have heard that name from Clayton's lips. Now, it frightened her. "'Mr. Clayton,' she said quietly, extending her hand. First, let me thank you for your chivalrous loyalty to my dear father. He has told me how noble and self-sacrificing you have been. How can we repay you?' Clayton noticed that she did not return his familiar salutation, but he felt no misgivings on that score. She had been through so much— this was no time to force his love upon her, he quickly realized. "'I am already repaid,' he said. "'Just to see you and Professor Porter both safe, well, and together again, I do not think that I could much longer have endured the pathos of his quiet and uncomplaining grief. It was the saddest experience of my life, Miss Porter, and then, added to it, there was my own grief. 
The greatest I have ever known. But his was so hopeless. His was pitiful. It taught me that no love, even that of a man for his wife, may be so deep and terrible and self-sacrificing as the love of a father for his daughter. The girl bowed her head. There was a question she wanted to ask, but it seemed almost sacrilegious in the face of the love of these two men and the terrible suffering they had endured while she had sat laughing and happy beside a godlike creature of the forest, eating delicious fruits and looking with eyes of love into answering eyes. But love is a strange master, and human nature is still stranger. So she asked her question. "'Where is the forest man who went to rescue you? Why did he not return?' "'I do not understand,' said Clayton. "'Whom do you mean?' "'He who has saved each of us, who saved me from the gorilla.' "'Oh!' cried Clayton in surprise. "'It was he who rescued you? "'You have not told me anything of your adventure now.' "'But the woodman,' she urged. "'Have you not seen him? "'When we heard the shots in the jungle, "'very faint and far away, he left me.' We had just reached the clearing, and he hurried off in the direction of the fighting. I know he went to aid you. Her tone was almost pleading, her manner tense with suppressed emotion. Clayton could not but notice it, and he wondered vaguely why she was so deeply moved, so anxious to know the whereabouts of this strange creature. Yet a feeling of apprehension of some impending sorrow haunted him, and in his breast, unknown to himself, was implanted the first germ of jealousy and suspicion of the ape-man to whom he owed his life. "'We did not see him,' he replied quietly. "'He did not join us.' And then, after a moment of thoughtful pause, "'Possibly he joined his own tribe, the men who attacked us.' He did not know why he said it, for he did not believe it. The girl looked at him wide-eyed for a moment. "'No!' she exclaimed vehemently, much too vehemently, he thought. "'It could not be. They were savages.' Clayton looked puzzled. "'He is a strange, half-savage creature of the jungle, Miss Porter. We know nothing of him. He neither speaks nor understands any European tongue, and his ornaments and weapons are those of the West Coast savages.' Clayton was speaking rapidly. "'There are no other human beings than savages within hundreds of miles, Miss Porter. He must belong to the tribes which attacked us, or to some other equally savage. He may even be a cannibal.' Jane blanched. "'I will not believe it,' she half whispered. "'It is not true. You shall see,' she said, addressing Clayton, "'that he will come back, and that he will prove that you are wrong. You do not know him as I do. I tell you that he is a gentleman.' Clayton was a generous and chivalrous man, but something in the girl's breathless defense of the forest man stirred him to unreasoning jealousy, so that for the instant he forgot all that they owed to this wild demigod, and he answered her with a half-sneer upon his lip. "'Possibly you are right, Miss Porter,' he said. "'But I do not think that any of us need worry about our carry-on-eating acquaintance. The chances are is that he is some half-demented castaway who will forget us more quickly, but no more surely than we shall forget him. He is only a beast of the jungle, Miss Porter.' The girl did not answer, but she felt her heart shrivel within her. She knew that Clayton spoke merely what he thought— and for the first time, she began to analyze the structure which supported her newfound love, and to subject its object to critical examination. Slowly, she turned and walked back to the cabin. She tried to imagine her wood god by her side in the saloon of an ocean liner. She saw him eating with his hands, tearing his food like a beast of prey, and wiping his greasy fingers upon his thighs. She shuddered. She saw him as she introduced him to her friends, uncouth, illiterate, a boar, and the girl winced. She had reached her room now, and she sat upon the edge of her bed of ferns and grasses, with one hand resting upon her rising and falling bosom. She felt the hard outline of the man's locket. She drew it out, holding it in the palm of her hand for a moment, with tear-blurred eyes bent upon it. Then she raised it to her lips, and crushing it there, buried her face in the soft ferns, sobbing. Beast! she murmured. Then God make me a beast, for man or beast I am yours. She did not see Clayton again that day. Esmeralda brought her supper to her, and she sent word to her father that she was suffering from the reaction following her adventure. The next morning, Clayton left early with a relief expedition in search of Lieutenant D'Arnault. There were two hundred armed men this time, with ten officers and two surgeons, and provisions for a week. 
They carried bedding and hammocks, the latter for transporting their sick and wounded. It was a determined and angry company, a punitive expedition, as well as one of relief. They reached the site of the skirmish of the previous expedition shortly after noon, and they were now travelling a short trail, and no time was lost in exploring. From there on, the elephant track led straight to Mubongo's village. It was but two o'clock when the head of the column halted upon the edge of the clearing. Lieutenant Carpentier, who was in command, immediately sent a portion of his force through the jungle to the opposite side of the village. Another detachment was dispatched to a point before the village gate, while he remained with the balance upon the south side of the clearing. It was arranged that the party which was to take its position to the north, and which would be the last to gain its station, should commence the assault, and that their opening volley should be the signal for a concentrated rush from all sides in an attempt to carry the village by storm at the first charge. For half an hour, the men with Lieutenant Carpentier crouched in the dense foliage of the jungle, waiting the signal. To them, it seemed like hours. They could see natives in the fields, and others moving in and out of the village gate. At length, the signal came. A sharp rattle of musketry, and like one man, an answering volley tore from the jungle to the west and to the south. The natives in the field dropped their implements and broke madly for the palisade. The French bullets mowed them down, and the French sailors bounded over their prostrate bodies straight for the village gate. So sudden and unexpected the assault had been that the whites reached the gate before the frightened natives could bar them, and in another minute the village street was filled with armed men fighting hand to hand in an inextricable tangle. For a few moments, the blacks held their ground within the entrance of the street, but the revolvers, rifles, and cutlasses of the Frenchmen crumpled the native spearmen and struck down the black archers with their bows half-drawn. Soon, the battle turned to a wild rout, and then to a grim massacre, for the French sailors had seen bits of Deonot's uniform upon several of the black warriors who opposed them. They spared the children and those of the women who they were not forced to kill in self-defense, but when at length they stopped, parting, blood-covered and sweating, it was because there lived, to oppose them, no single warrior of all the village of Mubonga. Carefully, they ransacked every hut and corner of the village, but no sign of dare not could they find. They questioned the prisoners by signs, and finally, one of the sailors who had served in the French Congo found that he could make them understand the bastard tongue that passes for language between the whites and the more degraded tribes of the coast. But even then, they could learn nothing definite regarding the fate of dare not. Only excited gestures and expressions of fear could they obtain in response to their inquiries concerning their fellows, and at last they became convinced that these were but evidences of guilt of these demons who had slaughtered and eaten their comrade two nights before. At length all hope left them, and they prepared to camp for the night within the village. The prisoners were herded into three huts where they were heavily guarded. Sentries were posted at the barred gates, and finally the village was wrapped in the silence of slumber, except for the wailing of the native women for their dead. The next morning, they set upon the return march. Their original intention had been to burn the village, but this idea was abandoned, and the prisoners were left behind, weeping and moaning, but with roofs to cover them, and a palisade for refuge from the beasts of the jungle. Slowly, the expedition retraced its steps of the preceding day. Ten loaded hammocks retarded its pace, and eight of them lay the more seriously wounded, while two swung beneath the weight of the dead. Clayton and Lieutenant Carpentier brought up the rear of the column, the Englishman silent in respect for the other's grief, for Deonot and Carpentier had been inseparable friends since boyhood. Clayton could not but realize that the Frenchman felt his grief the more keenly, because Deonot's sacrifices had been so futile, since Jane had been rescued before Deonot had fallen into the hands of the savages, and again because the service in which he had lost his life had been outside his duty, and for strangers and aliens. But when he spoke of it to Lieutenant Carpentier, the latter shook his head. "'No, monsieur,' he said. The Omnot will have chosen to die thus. I only grieve that I could not have died for him, or at least with him. I wish that you could have known him better, monsieur. He was indeed an officer and a gentleman, a title conferred on many, but deserved by so few. He did not die futilely, for his death in the cause of a strange American girl will make us, his comrades, face our ends the more bravely, however they may come to us. Clayton did not reply but within him rose a new respect for Frenchmen, which remained undimmed ever after. It was quite late when they reached the cabin by the beach. A single shot before they emerged from the jungle had announced to those in camp as well as on the ship that the expedition had been too late, for it had been prearranged that when they came within a mile or two of camp, one shot was to be fired to denote failure, or three for success, while two would have indicated that they had found no sign of either Deonot or his black captors. 
So it was a solemn party that awaited their coming, and few words were spoken as the dead and wounded men were tenderly placed in boats and rowed silently toward the cruiser. Clayton, exhausted from his five days of laborious marching through the jungle and from the effects of his two battles with the blacks, turned toward the cabin to seek a mouthful of food and then the comparative ease of his bed of grasses after two nights in the jungle. By the cabin door stood Jane. "'The poor lieutenant,' she asked. "'Did you find no trace of him?' "'We were too late, Miss Bolter,' he replied sadly. "'Tell me, what had happened?' she asked. "'I cannot, Miss Bolter. It is too horrible.' "'You do not mean that they tortured him?' she whispered. "'We do not know what they did to him before they killed him,' he answered his face drawn with fatigue and the sorrow he felt for poor Dale Knott, and he emphasized the word before. "'Before they killed him? What do you mean? They are not—' "'They are not—' She was thinking of what Clayton had said of the forest man's probable relation to this tribe, and she could not frame the awful word. "'Yes, Miss Porter, they were cannibals,' he said and was bitterly— for to him, too, had suddenly come the thought of the forest man, and the strange, unaccountable jealousy he had felt two days before swept over him once more. And then, in sudden brutality, that was unlike Clayton, as courteous consideration is unlike an ape, he blurted out, "'When your forest god left you, he was doubtless hurrying to the feast.' He was sorry ere the words were spoken, though he did not know how cruelly they had cut the girl." His regret was for his baseless disloyalty to one who had saved the lives of every member of his party and offered harm to none. The girl's head went high. "'There could be but one suitable reply to your assertion, Mr. Clayton,' she said icily. "'I regret that I am not a man that I might make it.' She turned quickly and entered the cabin. Clayton was an Englishman, so the girl had passed quite out of sight before he deduced what reply a man would have made. "'Pon my word!' he said ruefully. She called me a liar, and I fancy I jolly well deserved it, he added thoughtfully. Clayton, my boy, I know you're tired out and unstrung, but that's no reason why you should make an ass of yourself. You'd better go to bed. But before he did so, he called gently to Jane upon the opposite side of the sailcloth partition, for he wished to apologize, but he might as well have addressed the Sphinx. Then he wrote upon a piece of paper and shoved it beneath the partition. Jane saw the little note and ignored it, for she was very angry and hurt and mortified, but she was a woman, and so eventually she picked it up and read it. My dear Miss Porter, I had no reason to insinuate what I did. My only excuse is that my nerves must be unstrung, which is no excuse at all. Please try and think that I did not say it. I am very sorry. I would not have hurt you, above all others in the world. Say that you forgive me. William Cecil Clayton. He did think it, or he would have never said it, reasoned the girl. But it cannot be true. Oh, I know it is not true. One sentence in the letter frightened her. I would not have hurt you above all others in the world. A week ago, that sentence would have filled her with delight. Now it depressed her. She wished she had never met Clayton. She was sorry that she had ever seen the forest god. No, she was glad— and there was the other note she had found in the grass before the cabin, the day after she returned from the jungle. The love note signed by Tarzan of the Apes. Who could be this new suitor? If he were another of the wild denizens of this terrible forest, what might he do to claim her? Esmeralda, wake up, she cried. You make me so irritable, sleeping there peacefully when you know perfectly well that the world is filled with sorrow. Gabriel, screamed Esmeralda, sitting up. "'What is it now? A hypnoceros? Where is he, Miss Jane?' "'Nonsense, Esmeralda. There is nothing. <sighs> Go back to sleep. You are bad enough asleep, but you are infinitely worse awake.' "'Yes, honey. But what's the matter with you, precious? You act sort of disagranulated this evening.' "'Oh, Esmeralda, I'm just plain ugly tonight,' said the girl. "'Don't pay any attention to me. That's a dear.' "'Yes, honey.' Now you go right to sleep. Your nerves are all on edge. With all these ripopotamuses and many geniuses that Mr. Philander's been telling me about, Lord, it ain't no wonder we all got nervous prosecution. Jane crossed the room laughing, and kissing the faithful woman, bid Esmeralda good night. 
All right, another awesome episode here today. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Remember, uh, if you enjoy these audiobooks, you can find the full unabridged editions on YouTube, or if you want to help support the podcast, you can purchase the uh, full unabridged copies of these audiobooks all over, basically anywhere audiobooks are sold. You can you can just look for Another World Audiobooks, and you should be able to find them. If not, uh, get in touch with me, and I'll help you find uh, one of those books. You can buy them on Audible or any basically anywhere that you buy audiobooks. Thanks, guys, so much for listening, and remember to share the podcast with somebody that you know who might enjoy a free audiobook. Talk to you next time. Don't worry, you aren't the only one. You aren't the only business that needs help. You aren't the only person that has a hard time finding the right help at the right price. This is where Business Bloodline becomes your bloodline to temporary and permanent staffing. Business Bloodline specializes in hiring internet workers to creatively solve problems for your business. Business Bloodline does all the vetting and only delivers candidates that make sense for your needs and at a cost that you can afford. But 60 seconds isn't enough for me to tell you why hiring through Business Bloodline is safer, cheaper, and less time consuming. We would rather show you. To get more information or a business consultation, visit businessbloodline.com. If the job can be done on a computer, Business Bloodline can find a match. Visit businessbloodline.com and tell them that you heard about it on Another World Audiobooks to get 10% off your first hire. Remember to mention that you heard about it on Another World Audiobooks to get that 10% off. Businessbloodline.com